two drivers to win the title, one car. Who do you choose? The 1935 Spanish Grand Prix. A Grand Prix 80th anniversary special. Hello and welcome to another episode of Grand Prix 80th anniversary. Today's episode is the Spanish Grand Prix. So here we have on the left a computer generated image from the race. It's very vivid and specific. And on the right is the official program for the race, which came out 80 years ago. Um, this is a series where I review Grand Prix races that happened exactly 80 years ago to the day. Last week was the Modena Grand Prix, a GP race through Maserati's headquarters, which saw Maserati lose to Alfa, Alfa Romeo with their 8C35 chassis. So there on the left was the Alfa Romeo 8C35, spawn used by Ferrari, and the Maserati V8 RI used by Giuseppe Farina. And today, we're here with one of the most important races of all, the championship decider, the one that everybody must see, the Grand Prix of Spain, at the famous circuit of Lazarti in the holiday resort of San Sebastian. Here in this beautiful place to go on vacationing in, San Sebastian, just three miles south of it, is Lazarti, as you can see here. The track was built in 1923 for the Grand Prix of San Sebastian, which was a major race from the first time it was held. It was a fantastic road course, driving through villages such as Lazarte, from left to right, Oria, Urnieta, and Hernani, over the course of 10.8 miles. Very long circuit, but you can get around it in maybe six minutes. Six, six and a quarter minutes, at shortest. The most successful racer here is definitely Louis Chiro who has managed to win the San Sebastian Grand Prix twice for Bugatti in 1928 and 1929, as well as the Spanish Grand Prix two years ago for Alfa Romeo. A three-time winner, he's definitely a favorite here. Yes, Chiron was victorious with both empires in, in, on this circuit. In the 1920s, he won using the famous Targa Florio Bugatti here, spare wheel, and the Alfa Romeo P3, um, in 1933, before, before the Germans came through. But enough of that. Let's get to the main point of why we're here. This race is the seventh and final race in the 1935 European Drivers' Championship. Two weeks ago was the Italian Grand Prix, round number six at the legendary circuit of Monza. So there on the right is Monza. On the left, we have the Italian flag on the... Center is the official program. Might be a bit different than the last time. I don't exactly know which one it is. From that race, here are the current championship standings. Um, so yeah, Rudolf Caracciola holds a four-point lead over Luigi Fargioli, but even so, Fargioli can still win the championship by one point, or two points, if Caracciola strikes upon really bad luck. Fargioli must win the race, and Caracciola can't complete any more than... 14 laps to, in order for Fagioli to get at least a point of a title victory. Meanwhile, Dreyfus, who's already withdrawn from the season, he's calling it a year, and Tazio Nuvolari in fourth after some brilliant testing of the Alfa Romeo 8C35, which he will be using today as well, and Hans Stuck at, um, in fifth place, he was a fantastic driver. He came from 11th to 5th after winning the ra winning the Italian Grand Prix. And Manfred von Braukic has gone through lots of uh, tribulation and uh, problems, but he's managed to get through into 6th place without much difficulty. And then there is, in 7th, Goffredo Zander. Very well done for Maserati driver, because Maserati aren't that good in these circumstances. And in 8th place, Raymond Sommer. Remarkable performance for independent racing driver he has he's he has not finished any higher than sixth this season and he's among the top eight racing drivers he's ahead of Achille Varzi and Bernd Rosmeyer very great honor 
but only two of those eight names I showed you are actually really important. Those names are Rudolf Caracciola and Luigi Fagioli, the two men poised to win the 1935 European Drivers' Championship. They are from the same team, and they both have been really quick throughout the season. Take your pick. Germany or Italy? Who do you choose? Well, tell me who you would have wanted to win at the end, because obviously we're going to give away who it is at the end of the race. But tell me who you think will win at this moment. It depends on where you're from. If you're German, you'd probably be cheering for Caracciola. If you're Italian, you're probably rooting for Fagioli. But if you are a Frenchman, then you really don't care who wins, because you probably despise Germans as much as any other person from France. Although, of course, we can't ignore the rest of the field. We also have Auto Union here today, with Heinz Stuck, Achille Varzi, Bernd Rosmeier, and Paul Pietsch, who is only participating in the practice. So from left to right, there's Bernd Rosmeier, um, Heinz Stuck, Achille Varzi, and Paul Pietsch, who's in the T-car, or training car. The Auto Unions are the first to arrive on Thursday. Immediately, they set to work, with Heinstuck and Achille Varzi doing five and three slow-paced laps in their, in their cars, respectively. Stuck gets a time of six minutes, fifty-four seconds. Varzi's time doesn't get published. Oops. Now, even though that is really slow, really slow time, at l he's thinking, at least I'm faster than Von Brokic, who did, I think, a seven-minute lap. Very slow. Meanwhile, Rosemeyer, who's coming here for the first time, manages to defeat all before him, even the Mercedes Benz cars in the first day of practice, at 6 minutes 34 seconds, faster than Luigi Fagioli's 6 minute 37, or Caraccioli's 6 minute 45. Aha! Take that, Mercedes Benz! <sighs> well done, Rosemeyer. It's a promising racing driver so far. Another man who's unusually up bright and early for Thursday practice is Raymond Sommer, independent Frenchman who lies in a surprising 8th place in the EDC, who's racing his typical blue Alfa Romeo P3. The return of Blue Alpha Power! That's pretty much, you can call that his team because it's his catchphrase and very nice, yeah. After a day's work with the Silver Arrows and Mr. Sommer, it's Friday, and more teams have come. Among them is Scuderia Ferrari, with Nuvolari once again driving the brilliant 8C35 prototype, and his teammate Louis Chiron in an old-fashioned Tipo B, or P3. I, I just know how magnificent this machine is. Well, so far, it's been brilliant. Everyone dropped like flies at the Italian Grand Prix, and both of the chassis managed to survive more than half the distance. Um, and it came second to the Alto Union, Alto Unions, and it won the Modena Grand Prix, it vanquished all before it in the Mona Modena Grand Prix last week. So let's see what happens today. You are lucky to have that car, Tazio. That's Chiron on the right. And the 8C35 still looked like a very good car, as it matched the times of Rudolf Caracciola and Manfred von Braukic, that being 6 minutes 32 seconds. It's still 15 seconds off the pace, but that's probably because it was raining. And here's Nuvolari alongside his old teammate from 1932, Caracciola. Face it, Rudy, this is the future. With the, but the most astonishing performance is from Jean-Pierre Rimil of the Bugatti team. He is driving a chassis that was made in 1933, and is supposed to be uncompetitive compared to the Germans. But no. He did a lap of 6 minutes and 23 seconds. That's 9 seconds faster than the future. Faster than the future in an antique chassis. It's very interesting. Maybe there is some technical advantage being inserted into the Bugatti, probably for happiness from them. Um, even though that's still maybe 8 seconds off the pace. Then also there is Scuderia Subalpina, who's running short of drivers this weekend, with Etanceland still not fully recovered from his accident at Monza two weeks ago. So they're relying on Eugenio Siena and Scuderia Villa Padierna driver Marcel Leu. 
It's the car I failed in at Montenero. And Marcelleu has decided he's going to race for, for them at Brno next week as well. Now, the final day of practice. Just like yesterday, Achille Varzi is the unstoppable man again, setting fastest practice lap again of 6 minutes 8 seconds. Hans Stuck does 6 minutes 23, and Nuvolari matches the time of Luigi Fargioli at 6 minutes 26 seconds. But only Varzi was actually was actually doing going as fast as he should be going. It's simple. I'm going to win this. No, Varzi. We're going to win. That's Hans Stuck. With, and we're going to win with me coming ahead of you. It may be your race, but my championship. That's what Luigi Fascioli says. Nuvolari says, I'm sorry, guys. This is the future, and the future always wins. As it might be shown by that argument that just happened, the race is completely unpredictable. Jean-Pierre Rimil was fast at one point. Varzi was fast through the weekend which gives him an upper hand, but the Mercedes-Benz cars are poised to win the EDC. It's extremely difficult to decide on difficult to decide on a verdict here. So let's just take it as it comes and see what happens. And now, at last, the starting order, which is set by the number of the cars. Which means... There we are! Bugatti on pole position with Jean-Pierre Rimil. That's amazing! Bugatti starting ahead. And... Oh, the Alta Unions had, were pretty high up the entry list. They got some of the lowest numbers. Jean-Pierre Rimil was number two. Rosemeyer was number four. Varzi was number six. Wait a minute. Hey, I came pretty close. And meanwhile, but in, internally, probably, Varzi is thinking about Rimil. And thinking maybe I should go back. And in row two, Luigi Fargioli, who is starting ahead of Caracciola by far, is further proof that I'll win the EDC. Yes. And then we have Heinz Stuck in his auto union. Lucky Berndt, why don't I get number four? That's probably in reference to the fact that this is the second time he's missed the front row. And he he lost it to his teammates. Both of them. And in row three we have Vimil's teammate Robert Benoist. Very lucky Bugatti team today. Say we're in luck today. Um, because Benoit starts in 6th, Wimil starts in 1st. Brilliant. And Eugenio Siena and the Subalpina Maserati. And Tazio Nuvolari, who is racing the car from the future, Alfa Romeo 8C35. Objective number 1. Get past these idiots. And it's probably because they're in antique chassis, where, whereas this is from the future. But both of those cars he drove before. So, yeah. And row four, we have sort of two cars. Paul Piech was supposed had number had had number eighteen, but he was not racing. So Louis Chiron gets an entire row to himself. Ah, I get an entire row to myself. In the Alfa Romeo P3, he's starting in ninth, and in tenth, in row five, Manfred von Braukic starts ahead of Rudolf Caracciola. One hundred percent. Positive will finish on top. And Marcel Leu in a 6C34 rather than an 8, the usual yellow 8CM. This car feels very different. Let's say. Rudolf Caracciola in the Mercedes Benz W25. He says, Sorry, Fagioli, it's mine this year. I'll give it to you next year. Don't worry. I'll be as slow as possible so you can win. No, no, probably that's because Mercedes Benz are always on top. I don't know. And in the final row, we have the uncompetitive drivers. Raymond Sommer in his blue Alfa Romeo P3. This will be a great race, guaranteed. And localist, G Gennaro Leos Abad um, in, in a Bugatti Type 51, which was cutting edge just four years ago. No big deal, I'm just a local. And the flag falls! The flag drops, and the Alta Unions get to the first corner in the wink of an eye. Quick, let's get out of here, before the Bugatti's catch up. Specifically, Hans Stuck gets considerably far ahead of Varzi and Rosemeyer, since the two of them keep, keep on running over stones, which destroys their windscreens. Oh, damn stones, we missed the corner! And meanwhile, Hans Stuck just 
scampers off to take a lead. That might be certain, just like the Italian Grand Prix. At the end of the first lap, Hans Stuck and Bernd Rosmeier thundered by, followed by Fagioli and Caracciola, who bring the deafening howl of Mercedes-Benz. I'm still EDC champion at this rate. That's Caracciola. Next was Jean-Pierre Rimil, ahead of Nuvolari's car from the future once again. Behind them were Chiron and Von Braukic. Already in the pits, on lap one, Eugenio Siena, out of the race due to, suspen due, due to suspension problems, seven points for him, and Varzi, whose eyes were destroyed from the shattered windscreen glass. Oh, I can't see a flipping thing. Meanwhile, there's Paul Pietsch there, on standby. So Pietsch will be in, Varzi in Varzi's car until lap five, when he feels better. After two laps, Hans Stuck had a 12-second lead over Fagioli, who is still not going to win the championship at this rate, even though he just overtook Rosmeyer for second. I knew this would be my race. The Italian Grand Prix was your race. Maybe not the Spanish Grand Prix. Probably not two in a row, but it's possible. And then there's that CGI image um, where Rosmeyer gets a sudden shock that Fagioli has passed him. I'm going to be champion. What? And, um, yeah. There he is. After Caracciola and Wimil got by, Chiron and Nuvolari were next. Chiron managed to get past Nuvolari's car, surprisingly. Nuvo, you should go faster than that. After all, it's cutting-edge technology. You know what, Louis? I think you're right. Nuvolari, there must be something wrong with this car, because there's no way he's going to get passed by everybody. With one retirement already in just 19 minutes, Heinz Stuck has increased his lead by 3 seconds. Now following him are the two European Championship contenders, Fagioli ahead of Caracciola. Only one hour left until we can determine if you'll be champion or not, Rudy. Well, currently Fagioli's ahead of him. Might prove beneficial. Well, things aren't going in Bernd Rosmeyer's favor. In this one lap alone, he's been passed by three people, all in older chassis. Caracciola is in a one-year-old Mercedes-Benz, Chiron in the two-year-old Alpha P3, and even Remil's Bugatti, who's in fourth, right behind the ADC leader. Alright, what the heck is going on here? Meanwhile, Caracciola, it is genuinely remarkable that you're behind me. Yeah. Meanwhile, Louis Chiron sits right behind the Bugatti, who's also pondering about his return to Bugatti Link. Wow, that guy's really fast. Maybe I should go back. Probably this is because he's stopping to fix the windscreen. I guess he's a bit picky about it. About it. This will probably cost him valuable time. I'm now sympathetic with James May here. <sighs> As he goes into the pits. James May hates windscreens. So does Baron Rosmeyer. In the stop, the crew replaced the old windscreen with a new one made of sheet metal and fixed a wonky spark plug. This forced him into 8th position, going behind Von Braukic and Nuvolari. Oh, come on, time's running out! Meanwhile, Nuvolari and Von Braukic pass, and Nuvolari says... Is, 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 Nuvolari is trying to get past Von Braukic, but Nuvolari... No. But Von Braukic says, I'm afraid not. You lost last time. That's in reference to... I think you know where that comes from. What an incompetent Bugatti Type 51. Gennaro Leos is a localist, but who cares about him when he only has 180 horsepower in his vehicle? This is evident when Hans Stuck goes by him. Only four laps and he's already one entire lap behind. The progression of Grand Prix cars is staggering, isn't it? What? Already? The Bugatti Type 51 was actually cutting edge in 1931, just four years ago. But... Four years later, it's outclassed by cars with 200 more horsepower than it has. And now for the five-lap five update, brought to you by AI ACR Radio. So, Hein Stuck, after half an hour, has, has the lead. And in 13 seconds behind, Luigi Fargioli, and he's, Hein Stuck is holding his own, keeping steady ahead. Um, and Rudolf Caracciola, 17 seconds. Doing very well, trying to keep up with Fagioli, still within sight of him. And Jean-Pierre Rimil, still a minute, 
still within a minute of the Silver Arrows, and he's the first car to come behind them. Surprisingly, it's not an Italian. It's a Frenchman. We would never have believed that in a million years. Meanwhile, Louis Chiron, one and a half minutes off, and von Braukic is just 11 seconds behind Chiron, going to try and catch up. And Nuvolari is almost two minutes behind the Bugatti. So this really makes absolutely no sense at all, because the Type 59 was 14 laps behind last time, and Nuvolari was on the lead lap. It was a bit interesting. On lap, on lap six, Han Stuck was fast, but Fagioli was even quicker. Six minutes, ten second lap compared to Stuck's six minute eleven. We all know who I'll be at the end of this race. Well, we just have to wait and see. What the heck is going on with Tazio Nuvolari's car? It's being overtaken by everybody. Now Baron Drosmeyer has just gone past it. Being the other brave man here, something's seriously wrong with your car, Tazio. Um, we might have to consider that, because soon enough it might happen. Meanwhile, for the other man who lost his windscreen, Piech is now returning to the pits because Varzi feels better now. While they switched drivers, the team put a new sheet metal windscreen on his car. Alright, looks like he... Yeah. Von Braukic doing well and making up for lost ground. He's now past Louis Chiron's Alfa Romeo P3. Well, Louis Chiron admits, this car isn't as magnificent as it was two years ago. He did dominate the Spanish Grand Prix with that same car two years ago at the same track. But now he's just outclassed in it, but at least he can keep up. Oh, wait a minute. We've just received word from the AAZ that New Valari's engine is smoking at the beginning of the eighth lap. He's going to try and crank it up, see if it works. So he's going to do 20 repeated hand cranks of the engine, see if it's going to work. Um, nope. Well, there goes the other 8C prototype. Off it goes back to Torino. Six points for Nuvolari. He finishes fourth in the European Championship. And there's that quote. Proof that I was the moral victor. German Grand Prix. Okay, looks like Caracciola is coming to an alarming conclusion. A 6 minute 9.3 second lap puts him in front of Fagioli. Who knows, he might end up being European champion. The true champion shines past. Yes. However, Fagioli is still on his tail, almost as if he's a shadow. Meanwhile, one full lap behind, Achille Varzi is unbelievably fast, yet surprisingly smooth as he always is. He just recorded the new fastest lap of 6 minutes 2 seconds, averaging 110 miles an hour. Never let go of the racing line, or go all crazy with the wheel. <sighs> yes, he's, he's known for his very smooth skill, um, and great driving. Meanwhile, Hein Stuck remains invincible in the lead, still away from the visibility, visibility of the championship contenders, holding a 12 second lead. And now for the 10 lap update, brought to you by AIACR Radio. So Heinz Stuck remains in the lead, but Caracciola gained 5 seconds on him, Luigi Fargioli lost 5 seconds. So, yeah. Um, and Jean-Pierre Jean Emile has now, has now fell a minute behind, but he is ahead of Von Braukic, quite remarkable. He's managed to do that. And Luis Chiron is 2 minutes 27 seconds. Um, uh... Yeah, he's, he's right behind Von Braukic, but he really can't keep up, so no, there's no way he's going to pass it. And But then there's Baron Drosmeyer, who is three minutes behind, still, a, still able to keep up, but not, it's not going entirely well. Once again, Varzi's impeccab impeccable speed and great smoothness brings him to another fast slap of the day, this time under six minutes. A simply perfect car. That's quite right. It is a great car, but they'll have to replace it at the at the end of the year. And we're coming to the end of the year very soon. For the past hour or so, Heinz Stuck has maintained a good lead over the pack. But now it's beginning to shrink. Something in the engine might be a little less up to date as the rest of it. Now get out of here. This car's fine. Well, who knows? Let's see the next slide. But he's still in the lead after 12 laps. 
However, one lap later, his car gives in. The clutch refused to disengage from a certain gear, so it's gone. Stuck rece Stuck receives six points, and that's his championship there, finishing sixth overall. I guess you're right. This thing is so stiff it won't move. Yeah. Hmm. This gives Rudolf Caracciola the lead in the race, and an increasingly more likely first place in the EDC. We've only got until lap 15 to determine if he's our European Championship winner or not. Just forget it, my car's working seamlessly, there's no way I'll lose. Well, it all depends on what happens. And even though Auto Union tried to fix Heinz Stuck's car by doing a non-push start procedure, he came back six minutes later with the clutch refusing to go anywhere. So he's officially not coming back. So now it's your typical 1935 season race, with Caracciola in first and Fagioli in second, but Jean-Pierre Rimil has brought his Bugatti to a position that was easy for them in 1933, but hard for them now. That place is the podium. Ah, <sighs> Ettore Bugatti just, or Bartolomeo Costantini just going off in the distance. I miss the days, the days when we were kings. It's unfortunate that they aren't anymore. Clearly Bugatti still have some speed left in them. Meanwhile, after some really fast and smooth laps, Varzi has come in, quite apparently because the gears are falling off. I'm stationary and it's in fourth gear. Something's wrong with it. I could try and fix it for you. It's Paul Piech. While he's being refueled, he's going to try and fix it. Piech eventually managed to get the car going by getting the clutch to go or break and use it in fourth gear for the rest of the time. Oh, wait a minute. It looks like we might have a champion. Luigi Fagioli needs Caracciola to retire before lap 15 and for himself to win the race to get the smallest chance of taking the title. It's now lap 15 and Caracciola's car still works perfectly. So there we are. Rudolf Caracciola, 1935 European Champion. I knew I would come out on top. What? Fagioli's now been denied the chance of taking an indefinite victory. He could still win the title by complete, completing more distance if Rudolf Caracciola retires within the next seven laps. But if that happens, Fagioli absolutely must win the race. He can't lose. And now for the halfway point leaderboard from AIACR Radio. Rudolf Caracciola, 90% likely to be world champion, has a half minute lead over Luigi Fagioli. Um, and Jean-Pierre Rimil is still qu not quite two minutes behind yet, but he's keeping up, he's doing remarkably well, and he's in third place. It's not easy for them anymore, because since 1934, Bugatti have been a completely outclassed team. Um, and Baron de Rosmeyer, three minutes behind, he's just got past Louis Chiron, and, um... Manfred von Braukic is about four minutes off, and Robert Benoist has been lapped, because his Bugatti does not have some sort of advantage, and it's the usual lap behind. It's now time to resaturate the fuel. Rudolf Caracciola comes in first on lap 16, with Fagioli in the lead for a lap until he comes in too. Oh, here he comes. Ha 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 ha! Well... That's only going to be that way for six minutes, Fagioli. You can't keep the lead unless F Caracciolo does not return from the pit. Meanwhile, on the same lap, the, le the left rear tire of Fombraukic had gone flat at 143 miles an hour, and he was now struggling to keep it on the road. German GP 1935 flashback! Stop reminding me about this! Well, it is very fairly similar, because... He was driving at high speed, he was going to try and win the race, left rear tire exploded, and there he goes, he lost it. But, exact same tire and exact same kind of location. To the naked eye, it looked like his tire went flat because of running over the stones. Luckily, however, it was blown off right next to the grandstand, so he could stop immediately to replace it. Come on, guys, we can't let that happen again. Um... Yeah, because Von Brokic hates to be reminded of it, and just, yeah. 
After Von Braukic rejoined the track, he managed to get past Bernd Rosemeyer's horsepowerless Auto Union and Louis Chiron's Old Alpha. What? Engine only running on 80% original power? Well, something clearly is wrong with Rosemeyer. We're going to figure out what it is later. The past two minutes never happened. For, and now for AIACR Radio's 20 lap update, two thirds of the way through. Caracciola has now built up a bigger lead. Now he's a minute ahead, more than a minute ahead of Fagioli. And Fa Wimil, Wimil still remains in third position, doing very well, remarkably good job. But Von Braukic, hot on his tail, probably going to try and catch up to him soon. Bernd Rosemeyer is dangerously close to falling, maybe four laps behind, while Louis Chiron has good road holding in his old Alfa Romeo, and Robert Benoit is still a lap behind. Jean-Pierre Remille is really at his shining moment. Even though his car has, oops, his car has 125 less horsepower than the Germans had, he's been able to keep ahead of Von Braukic, even though he is within sight of Remille. Okay, I accept the challenge. Von Braukic has now come up, has now come right on his tail and is going to try and catch up. But can Von Braukic pass immediately? How long can Vimil hold up? Hold up. Well, as it turns out, the Bugatti managed to keep the Mercedes-Benz behind it for just one lap before Von Braukic managed to get past it. Vimil, Vimil accepts that Von Braukic gets past him, but Vimil will remind him. Remember to respect the art. This means that all three Mercedes-Benz cars are in the top three positions once again. And even though Caracciola is now the definitive European champion, Fagioli is still trying to hunt him down. I will now demonstrate why I should have been the EDC champion. I mean, we've come to lap 23 and now Caracciola has taken an indefinite a definitive European champion title. And Fagioli's going to try and go faster. From lap 23 to 25, Fagioli does laps about 5 to 8 seconds faster than Caracciola. That means coming close to 6 minutes. But even so, Rudolph remains ahead by 45 seconds. Sorry, Luigi, you can't take facts away. I am EDC champion. Yeah, yeah. With just five laps to go, let's see the situation report from AIACR Radio. So, Fagioli closed the gap, got 45 seconds under, underneath him, and now that Von Braukic has passed Vimil, it's now all three Mercedes-Benz in all three positions, um, Von Braukic two minutes behind his friend. Three minutes behind Caracciola is Vimil, I mean, he's obviously not as fast as the Germans, but he's able to keep up. Louis Chiron also can keep up, but he's 3 minutes 26 seconds. Bernd Rosmeyer, just 4 minutes behind. Robert Benoist has been lapped again, 2 laps behind. Paul Pietsch, driving a Kili Varzi's car, now comes to the pits with a similar problem to that of Hans Stuck. The transmission stopped working at the Andoine village. So that's... Right, sorry about that. Um, that was because of the automated record limit. Um, that just stopped me at random. I'm going to have to finish it now. Anyway, we continue on from where we left. Paul Pietsch, driving a Kili Varzi's car, comes to the pits with a similar problem to that of Heinz Stuck. The transmission stopped working at the Andoine village, and so that's four points to Varzi and ninth place in the championship. Well, that's that. i got to get this thing back to Zvikau. Paul Pietsch, yes, crashed it at, at a tunnel through the Andoine. Or not crashed it, just lost the transmission. So he's going to send it back to Zvika, where Auto Union makes their cars. Meanwhile, just one lap later, Varzi's good friend Louis Chiron comes in too with a broken crankcase, which is an engine related problem, and not enough oil to complete the remaining 12 minutes. Four points to Chiron, putting him one position behind Varzi in the final title, which is 10th. Enzo, let's go to Brno. So, yes, that means. Both for both Ferrari drivers are off, are are out of the race, and they're off to Brno. Meanwhile, Jean Pierre Remille passes by. and says, "Louis, you should come back to Bugatti." And maybe just at this rate, Louis might Louis might just consider that. 
After Chiron was out, Rosemeyer took fifth place, but his auto union had a leaking head gasket, which meant that his engine couldn't cool, and that meant that he couldn't go as fast as he wanted to. Come on, let this day end. Eh, it's going okay. I mean, Rosemeyer was one of those people who could keep on the lead lap, but since he can't go as fast as he wants to anymore, he might be lapped by them. Uh, yeah. And on the last lap, Marcel Leyu and Gennaro Leos were five and nine laps down, respectively. And since they were extremely slow compared to Mercedes-Benz, they stopped racing and pulled into, the, into their pits, returning home. It's a mechanical problem. That's Leu, who is um, in the Scuderia Subalpina pits, and he's trying to find an excuse for just not for not not trying to find a lame excuse, saying it's a mechanical problem. And meanwhile, Gennaro Leos says, "Well, I'm returning home. I'm going home," and it looks like he's already made his way through the car park. He probably knows this place really well. He, after all, he's a localist who's watched the Spanish Grand Prix. Raymond Sommer is doing fine. He's not really doing it so bad. And so, at the end of three hours, nine minutes, and 59.4 seconds, Rudolf Caracciola comes to the finish line to win both the race and the 1935 AIACR European Drivers' Championship. <sighs> yes, it's the best day of my life! So yeah, Rudolf Caracciola takes the title and... And we will explain why it is the best day of his life. And coming in, coming after him is the remaining Daimler-Benz army, bringing us to a 1-2-3 finish for them, with former championship contender Fagioli following Karac, 43 seconds behind. Von Braukic perseveres after all the trials and tribulation to come third for them, in both the race and the championship. A Merck Benz 1-2-3 in the race and the championship, what a team. So yeah, the Von Braukic managed to finish third, and with that extra advantage, being being able to finish ahead of Wimil, he finished, um, he managed to get third place, a remarkable, because, and also, maybe a good reason for why they came in the top three in the championship is because they're the only ones who participate in every single race. Everyone else missed at least one race. In fourth place, the first car to come behind the mighty German cars is, remarkably, not an Alfa Romeo or a Maserati, it was a Bugatti. Monumental drive for Jean-Pierre Rimil, who lapped as fast as von Braukic did, has successfully proven that Bugatti are still very much with us, not some blue car stuck in 1933. Ettore Bugatti is, has been, was an artistic man, brought the Bugatti Type 35, 51, and 59, and Type 54, brilliant racing cars, always known to be brilliant, and Jean-Pierre Rimil has, has proved the potential of the Type 59 with a great drive for them in the Spanish Grand Prix. The art of motor racing will remain with us forever. Bugatti are still with us. They are not out of the, out of the game yet. And they probably won't be for a very long time, because they're always going to try and keep up. And in fifth, Bjorn Rosmeyer managed to salvage his auto union to a lead lap finish, putting him seventh in the championship. A brilliant performance for a person who's only been racing automobiles for four months. This is promising for the 1936 season. Well, we shall see how that turns out, Mr. Rosmeyer. And now, we must show why Rudolf Caracciola deserved to win the European Drivers' Championship. Yep, once again we're going to put on some special music for this scene, but it started back at Monte Carlo in 1933. Caracciola and his friend Louis Chiron entered two Alfa Romeo Monzas under the name Scuderia CC. They had a well thought out plan for the season. Every major race, every corner of motor racing, driving many different cars. And this is the Monza, the Alfa Romeo Monza that they were going to use in, in the Grand Prix races. So they were forced to be reckoned with at Spa Francorchamps, Monaco, Monza, Le Mans, Mille Miglia, all over the place. But unfortunately, that plan never happened. After 24 laps of competitive practice in the Monte Carlo Grand Prix, while trying to improve on the fastest time 
He arrived at the tabac corner, he lo- and he locked up his brakes and slid sideways. Caracciola steered against the harbor wind to- and toward the stone barrier, where his Alfa Romeo crashed into it very hard indeed. So here's a basic illustration. This is Caracciola about to crash into what looks like a fatal a fatal crash into the barrier. So he swears and he gets very badly hurt, and Louis Chiron follows him, praying that, that it's not Caracciola that's injured, but it is. Caracciola was very, very badly hurt. Chiron rushed immediately to help him as he collapsed out of his destroyed Monza. It was then that Caracciola realized that he fractured his thigh and had bad facial injuries. Rudolph was rushed to hospital, where he was diagnosed with an operation on his hip, which would keep him off the Grand Prix circuit for the rest of the year. And when he was better at the end of 1933, things got even worse. His wife, Charlotte, was skiing in the Swiss Alps in 1934 when an avalanche fell upon her, killing Charlotte. These devastating accidents had put Caracciola in serious consideration of never, never going to Grand Prix racing ever again. But something told him in his mind to just persevere with what he, what he does. After all, he is under contract with Mercedes-Benz, a leading GP team. And this year was the hell of a reward for a man who had such terrible bad luck in past years. This year he has won six races, including the Tripoli Grand Prix, four of the seven Grand Prix races, or championship races, and a victory at his beloved Nürburgring. So this is painting of him after winning the Tripoli Grand Prix, but I guess we can say it's the Spanish Grand Prix. Truly, the greatest day of my entire life. Caracciola is blessed to be in such an amazing position. And now we must crown him. Rudolf Caracciola, 1935 AIACR European Drivers' Champion. Winner of the return of the AIACR Championship. Let's see if he will defend his honor for, for the 1936 season. Let's see how this works. And now, of course, we show you the race results and the final championship standings. Sorry if the music was was nice and I got rid of it. Rudolf Caracciola won that race, taking a well-deserved position, first place. And after three hours and ten minutes. Thrilling hours, he comes in, takes the championship, and Fagioli and von Braukic follow him, follow him dutifully. 43 seconds behind, Fagioli takes a respectable second place in the championship, while von Braukic comes third in both worlds, race and the championship. Well done for the Mercedes-Benz team, they vanquished everyone before them in both worlds. And meanwhile, behind them comes, comes Jean-Pierre Rimil. A really amazing driver. He received four points, even though he finished 20th in the championship this year. He has been a great driver in all aspects. And then there's Bjorn Drosmeier, who, um, who unfortunately lost his coolant, um, which meant he had to be lapped by Caracciola, um, and therefore he received four points. Well done for him. And Robert Benoist, um managed to get back on the lead lap. I guess somehow there was a power surge from his car because there were he was two laps behind. Um, Raymond Sommer was another lap off. I mean, even though his car underneath was identical to Louis Chiron's, he just couldn't keep up. Something must have been different. But at least he managed to finish because with this, he finishes eighth in the championship, along with all the Alfa Romeos and Auto Unions and Mercedes-Benzes. Really great. And Louis Chiron had an engine failure quite late into the race, and a lack of oil to complete the race. He did very well, though. He managed to keep up, and things did very well. Marcel Leu, his Scuderia Subalpina, had a mechanical problem at four, with four points, and uh, Achille Varzi and Paul Piech, his Auto Union AG, racing for Auto Union, Achille Varzi retains the points because it's his car, not Paul Piech's. But Paul Piech did race 
the car at, at various points, but his transmission broke at Andoine, and I managed to go through. Gennaro Leo Zabad was running at the la at, on the last lap, but he was nine laps behind, which and w which was past the four point distance. He actually received five points. He was too slow, so he just went to the parking lot, went home. And then there was Hans Stuck. His clutch his clutch went on lap thirteen, and he received six points for that respectable top ten finish in the championship. And then finally Tatsu Nuvolari. Now. Various sources are arguing that it was a suspension that he rolled to a stop at his pits with the suspension breaking apart um, on lap 7, which means he received 7 points. Or, he finished on lap 8 with an engine problem, so he received 6 points. But, more people have voted in favor of the engine, so we're going to give him 6 points for this. And Eugenio Siena lost the suspension spring on the first lap giving him seven points and his only start this year. And of course, the final championship standings. We're going to show you the top nine of the Drivers' Championship. So, from left to right, we have the position, the driver, the team they were racing for, or the car they used, how many points they had, and their highlight of the season. Rudolf Caracciola won the championship by five points over Luigi Fargio, his teammate Fargioli, and... Therefore, he um, he receives the crown of European champion and took four Grand de Prix victories, which and he won the French Grand Prix, the Swiss Grand Prix, the Belgian Grand Prix, and the Spanish Grand Prix. Really brilliant job. And Luigi Fargioli, the Mercedes in, in, did respect, and Manfred von Braukic. Mercedes-Benz were the only team to participate in all seven Grand de Prix races, um, which meant that von Braukic had the advantage, even though he was he struck upon bad luck four out of the seven times. Um, he managed to act, to to finish third because of his commitment and consistency. He came second at Montleri. Uh, oh yeah, Luigi Fagioli won at Monte Carlo, taking a brilliant victory over the Italians. Von Braukic came second to Caracciola at Montleri, was quite literally behind him. And then behind behind them are the Ferrari drivers of Tazio Nuvolari and Rene Dreyfus. We cannot deny the fact that Nuvolari's highlight of the year was his amazing victory at the German Grand Prix. And he comes forth due to his great um, commitment. Um, and Nuvolari received even more bad luck than Von, Bra than von Braukic did. I mean, Von Braukic finished three times, Nuvolari only finished twice, but Nuvolari's commitment puts him in fourth. Very well done. And Rene Dreyfus took, and also drove the Alfa Romeo 8C35 and Tipo B, and is tied with Heinz Stuck, but completed more distance overall. And his highlights of the year is the second place at Monaco, and the second place at the Italian Grand Prix as well. And Hans Stuck um, was the lead was lead, led the Auto Unions to sixth place, not quite the top five, but they definitely proved that they were competitive because all three drivers finished in the top ten. Um, tied with Dreyfus, won the one at Monza, um, did a brilliant job, and Bernd Rosmeyer in the Auto Union. Um, tied with Raymond Sommer and Achille Varzi, but he completed most distance overall. Um, um, and he came, no, he finished third at, at Bremgarten, and that's his major highlight of the season. I mean, his highlight overall in actual Grand Prix racing is the Eiferin, but no. And then was, there was Raymond Sommer, um, remarkable drive for this privateer driver who, raced, who races blue-colored Maseratis and Alfa Romeos, and he shows that commitment is always important. Important. You don't have to be fast. You need to be committed to your job. He didn't finish any higher than sixth this season, and he's come eighth. Um, he finished the race four times at Monte Carlo, France, Switzerland, and Spain. And Achille Varzi finished ninth. He had four 75% uh, distance finishes. He finished the race three times, but... 
the the Spanish Grand Prix um, is classified as a finish because he completed 75% distance. And Louis Chiron, who only missed one race out of all the races that happened, um, managed to come third at, at Spa, despite collapsing at the end of it, and being able to keep himself in the top ten was a, to show that he's still consistent uh, in the arrival of the, of the Germans. And finally, the season's highlights. There were seven Grand de Prouve races this year, more than any other year before. The first race was the Monte Carlo Grand Prix, Fagioli in command ahead of the Italian onslaught. So, yeah, here is this really beautiful painting by Carlo Demand of Fagioli leading Dreyfus through the, through the final corner and, and the buildings, too. They're, they're really specific and very well detailed. And on the left, there is the official pro, the legendary official program for it. Because, and I actually have one of them. Um, yeah, I'm lucky to, be, to have that. And race number two is the French Grand Prix, a fantastic duel between Caracciola and Fagioli, which ends with Fagioli going three laps behind. Here's another Carlo Demand painting. Um, and it was where Caracciola and Fagioli fought for the position of being in first. And, and there's the French flag. In uh, race number three, there's the Belgian Grand Prix, where... René Dreyfus vomits from inhaling special fuel and a feud between Neubauer and Fagioli. That's a very hilarious. And so on the left is a, is um, raw footage of what happened. So there's F Dreyfus stranded on the track after vomiting fuel and Attilio Marinani is going to take over his car and lift Dreyfus to safety. Meanwhile, von Braukic is sunbathing after retiring from the race, and Fagioli and Neubauer are getting to a quite loud discussion, and then Fagioli says, that's it, I'm not going into the car anymore, and Neubauer's angry, and calls von Braukic down. And, of course, there's the German Grand Prix, where Nuvolari defeats nine superior German cars on their home turf, with a car that had 100 less BHP. So there was the Alfa Romeo Tipo B, the... Sorry about that. So there is the Alfa Romeo P3 that Nuvolari used. It had number 12. It it went through so many occasions. There, Here's like a couple of paintings of him just trying to catch up or getting past Germans who struggle. Or, and of course, these two paintings which indicate when von Braukic lost his left rear tire. And... And... And Nuvolari could surge past and take victory. And race number five, the Swiss Grand Prix, where Rudolf Caracciola's Regenmeister, or Rainmaster, talent shines through. The rain is his favorite, and he can pretty much go, go just as fast, if not faster, than non-rain pace in the rain. Um... Which is what probably explains why he gets a four second lead after maybe half half a lap um, yeah, and there was race number six there was the Italian Grand Prix, a brilliant victory for Heinstuck and auto Union, and a successful test of the alpha eight c thirty five prototype so there here we have Monza, a newly reconstructed version of it, passing by the parabolica curve going into the oval and Heinz Stuck taking well-deserved victory, and Alfa Romeo testing what might be the most brilliant car ever made. Um, and the Italian flag. And the final race, of course, this one, the Spanish Grand Prix, Rudolf Carat where Rudolf Caracciola is given a well-deserved title of 1935 European Drivers Champion. So here, once again, is his quote from earlier on. It has, re it has really been an amazing championship this year, and hopefully it will be that way for next year. After listening to the Nazi and Italian anthems for the drivers on the podium, that's it for the 1935 championship. 
He returned next April for the Grand Prix of Monaco, 1936. So, we have uh, on the left, that was the official program for it, and the circuit itself, and the, the, le the legendary circuit itself, and the beautiful south of France um, harbor that Monaco's at. It's lovely. The championship may be over, but, however, the major Grand Prix racing is not done yet. Tune in next week for the Mazari Grand Prix in Brno, Czechoslovakia. Jumping back into 2015, thank you very much for watching this video. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, click the like button or the subscribe button, or leave a comment. And I'll see you next week for the Season 1 finale at Brno. Jeez, 54 minutes. That's the longest video I've ever done. Or second longest.